Endoparasitic was a unique game, with its novel control scheme of using the mouse to do everything from moving and reloading, making for an interesting experience. The question is, will the sequel be able to double up on its predecessor? I'm Mac, and I've got your back. This is Jetavision's review of Endoparasitic 2. Endoparasitic 2 takes place three months after the first game, so if you haven't played that, uh... Spoilers! In the first game, which takes place on a research facility on an asteroid, we played as Synth, who got all but one of his limbs torn off, leaving just his right arm. After fighting his way through the base, we find out that a fellow scientist named Lucy triggered an outbreak of parasites, which chose her to be their god or something. She leaves Synth in the research facility, left for dead. But three months later, he manages to get on a spacecraft to board a nearby luxury cruise spaceship. All would be fine and dandy like salty candy if it weren't for the fact that everyone's either dead or turned into weird ass freaks. So oh, well, it's back to desperately fighting for your survival. You've gotta try and reach the bottom floor of the spaceship, but since the elevator's busted, you'll have to repair it from a console one floor at a time, descending to the lower levels. Visually, the game is quite a step up. It does maintain the sterile, colorless presentation, but everything seems to have much more detail. Objects appear much more three-dimensional, and the animations of the enemies also have much more movement as well. A small thing, but we did notice that the perspectives are kind of wonky. Sometimes synth and the enemy appear comically small in relation to the environment. I don't know if that's intentional, but it's kind of weird. As far as the gameplay goes, Endoparasitic 2 retains much of the mechanics from the original. To simulate only having one hand, only the mouse is used for the entirety of the game. You must load each bullet into your weapons individually, and you have to click and drag to move. It's worth noting that movement feels much smoother and refined here. You can't move and shoot at the same time. You must unholster your weapon to fire, then holster to move. Since reloading is done manually, it's appropriately arduous. Additionally, Additionally, visibility is quite limited. These aspects make the player feel a lot more vulnerable, and thus positioning yourself wisely is key. You still have your parasitic friend burrowing into your brain, which acts as your health bar. Anytime you take damage, it moves closer to your brain, but it also inches towards it over time regardless, pushing the player to act with a little more urgency, and keeps stocked up on medical items, which recedes its advance. Some things have changed a bit, however. How much you can carry in the inventory is now based on weight. Everything from ammo, syringes, and crafting items has a weight to it, and going over the limitations of what you're allowed to carry makes you move slower. Extra items can be kept in the elevator for later use. This change was done very well. You never quite feel adequately stocked on items, but you also feel as though you're constantly risking going over your weight limit. It does a good job of putting the player in between a rock and a hard place, adding to the feeling of vulnerability the game's clearly going for. Aiming now plays a bigger role. You can no longer simply shoot into an enemy to kill it, but rather you need to shoot at weak spots, which makes kills much more satisfying to land. Speaking about how combat's changed, it's worth noting that Endoparasitic 2 does not hesitate to turn up the heat on its players. Throughout the game, you'll encounter these weird walls of biomass that you've gotta shoot to go through, and this triggers a pretty wild combat section. The music ramps up, and the enemies grow faster and numerous, making for some pretty intense segments as you frantically fight your way through the freaks. Another big addition is the crafting mechanic. You can find items throughout the levels and combine them to make things like more powerful medical items and ammunition. You can even craft weapon upgrades. We were originally pretty skeptical of this system, as it felt quite out of place in a game like this. But after playing the game, I can say that we don't hate it. Something we didn't like was how accessing your inventory was done. Instead of scrolling up on your mouse wheel like before, you now have to right click a bag located at the bottom of your body. We make note of this because for whatever reason, depending on how you move, the bag can actually go underneath the character, obscuring it and making it harder or even straight up impossible to access inventory, which was a minor annoyance which persisted through the game. Also, you check the map by pulling your wrist into a certain position, and we found ourselves accidentally checking the map when we really intend to do something like a lever, which, again, was a minor annoyance. And in the late game, when your body is covered with guns, it becomes much harder to pull out the gun you need as the click boxes become quite frustrating. And while we're going on a tangent about the bad stuff, sometimes you have to unlock a door by accessing a console, which may or may not make you complete a logic puzzle. You're not told the rules, it's just a bunch of numbers that show up on a screen and you have to figure out the pattern. This is more so a personal pet peeve of ours regarding game design, you know, having to do mini games in order to progress. I mean, what's the point? 
point. These challenges aren't that interesting. They don't really add anything to the game. It's just an arbitrary roadblock. You can take them out and nothing about the game would really change. Anyways, gameplay is a very simple loop. Each level is a maze-like setup and you've got to make your way to a console to unlock the next floor for the elevator to go to. Because stairs don't exist here. This is easier said than done, as the console is often locked behind a series of barriers, which must be opened by pulling a series of levers spread throughout the map, which themselves are also locked behind a series of barriers. Navigation is somewhat easy as you often have a trail of wires to follow guiding you to your next objective, and the in-game map shows you where you have and haven't been. In many ways, even though the novelty of its control scheme has mostly diminished, Endo Parasitic 2 improves on its predecessor and more than justifies its existence. It's been refined, built upon, and expanded, and for that, we commend it. Unfortunately, we honestly began liking this game less the longer we played it. Endo Parasitic 1 had a lot of levels that really shine through thanks to their good design. We still remember that one where you're being chased down a narrow hallway, and you have to retreat, shoot, and reload as fast as possible before reaching the end of the corridor. Meanwhile, the design of the levels here remain mostly the same throughout the entire game. Navigate to a lever to open a door beyond which another lever is located, which opens a door beyond which another lever is located, which opens a door beyond which another so on and so forth. It becomes extremely repetitive, and the increasingly complex maze-like layouts only add to the fatigue. The sterile graphics and repetitive environments really don't help either. To be fair, special enemy variants are added. There's this invisible enemy you have to detect with a radar that doubles as a stun gun. <laughs> listening closely to the beeps, which grow more constant as it moves closer. You then stun them and blast their ass away. There's also this frog-like creature that's invulnerable to attack and follows the player relentlessly, and can only be temporarily stopped with a stun gun. However, if you play it smart, you can trap it inside a room and move on with the level without needing to worry about it. It was actually really fun figuring out how to contain this thing. Later, you find out that it can be killed if you turn the lights off. You'll have to do so with limited visibility, but if you can blast away at these weird little orbs connected to its tendrils, you can kill it for good. Now, encountering these enemies for the first time was a legitimately cool cool experience. It added a few bumps in interest at a point in the game where we were quite bored with it. The problem is these enemies become annoyingly overused. I mean, they were fun to deal with when we were unfamiliar with them when they were new, but once you get the hang of them, that appeal drops off, and they become less and less fun to encounter. At some point, it just became a hassle, you know? It's just that there's kind of a process needed to take these things down, which really began to feel quite tedious. And this is another area the first game really has over this one. It had unique enemy variants, and yeah, their appeal ran out fast, but the thing is, it never lingered on them. It switched things up in good time, which kept it from getting stale. Endo Parasitic 2 is also a good case study into how a longer video game doesn't translate into a better video game. You know, maybe they wanted to provide a more full and substantial experience, but the problem is, it really feels stretched thin. Honestly, by the time Endo Parasitic 2 had ended, we felt relieved. Not relieved out of a sense of accomplishment, but more so, thank god I don't have to play this thing anymore. Another place where its predecessor blows this one out of the water. It didn't run on for too long, and that's why it's easier to like. Seeing as how the predecessor, being notably better than its follow-up, seems to be a bit of a theme here, let's dig a little deeper into the story. Despite an indirect method of telling its story, the first game still kept you invested by consistently hammering out intriguing story beats. Meanwhile, Endo Parasitic 2 feels much lighter on the story. The little tidbits that are there feel quite stretched and sparse. It just doesn't feel like there's a lot to uncover. Just another reason the game feels very tedious. There's not much of a story to follow here. The trail of breadcrumbs, so to speak, just isn't there. There's no hook, no intrigue, nothing to keep you interested. And then there's this new character they introduced named Karis. This wheelchair-bound guy who's holed up in his little lab researching a cure for the parasite, and in return for biomass samples you find throughout the game, he gives you supplies. What's odd about this character is that apparently him and Synth have a history of a strong bond on the asteroid research base, apparently. Karis, I knew him. We used to work together on the asteroid base. We were close for a long time before he left. And then their relationship soured when Karis just up and left. No, I was in love with him because I'm fucking gay. And what's striking to us is how little this character seems to matter. He doesn't really have that much dialogue, which is funny because he literally gives the player a radio for the express purpose of communication. Here. What's this? 
a comms radio so we can communicate wherever you are on the Ark ship. But said radio is just never used. And even though this subplot is quite pointless... Sin. Optimism is... all... I've got left. <laughs> It has the side effect of doing my boy Sin dirty. Before he was unlikable, but like, in a cool way, you know? The first game gave us the idea of a genius, egotistical narcissist who's gonna get down to brass tacks regardless of his predicament. He's gonna get to the bottom of this outbreak because science, bitch. But with this new tidbit of information, it implies that the reason he is the way that he is is because he's whiny over a breakup. It's just really lame. They tried to add death to a character that didn't really need it, and he's arguably worse off because of it. There's these moments in the game when Sin reads these letters left by other people. Is this all these people had to do? Sit around and gossip? What a waste. Yeah, he reads a recipe and he's like, oh, that's disgusting. That's repulsive. Or he reads a letter where someone talks about his day and he's like, oh, these people are so lazy. So vapid, so dull. I get what they're going for, they're trying to show how disconnected Synth is from society as a result of his obsession with science and research, but honestly these lines came off more like someone trying as hard as they can be to be like an edgy anime antagonist. Mm, you humans are a confusing bunch. You laze about chasing impractical pleasures instead of working towards your own betterment. Yeah, okay, buddy. I'm gonna discuss the ending a bit, so spoilers if you really care. You can skip to this timestamp for our final thoughts. The final boss was alright, pretty easy to beat once you figure out how to damage it. Apparently, the parasites turn Lucy into a eldritch abomination or whatever. Sent? I wish you would have killed me when you had the chance. Now, the unworthy must die! You gotta kill her. What I don't get is, why doesn't she just grab him? Like, you have all these arms, just pick him up and smash him into the floor. Throw him against the wall or something. You know, it's not like he can run away. So you beat Lucy and then this happens. It's a shame, really. What a waste of resources. I'll fix this, no matter what it takes. Like what, that's it? What an unrewarding way to finish the game. So they don't exactly leave on a cliffhanger, but they leave the possibility of a sequel open. And to be honest, they really fumbled this. If you're gonna imply another game, that's fine, but you wanna hype that bad boy up. Get people excited for what's to come. And this ending does not do that whatsoever. It's also worth noting that unlike the first game, there's no extra content like the roguelike endemic mode, nor any harder difficulty settings, which kind of sucks. That's all we've got to say about Endoparasitic 2. It's difficult to say whether it's good or bad. On one hand, it makes some really big improvements and made some good changes, which made for a great initial first impression. Smoother controls, better inventory, satisfying gunplay, intense combat, and to an extent, the crafting system. For the first half of the game, we really enjoyed ourselves. But the second half was a total slog, with little story to keep us hooked, and the levels becoming increasingly tedious with their minimal variety. It really sucks, because on a level, we like Endoparasitic Parasitic 2. We want to say it's a good game because in many ways it is. But when we walk away feeling more fatigued and mentally drained than anything, we can't afford much wiggle room here. That's why Jetavision's score for Endo Parasitic 2 is a 6.5 out of 10. As far as recommendations go, it's a hard one, folks. If you're interested in this game, honestly, check out its predecessor. It's only like $2 cheaper, the way it plays is similar, but it's a much more satisfiable experience. And hey, maybe check out our review on that game. Otherwise, if you've already played that game and wanna see how the story's continued, well, $12 isn't that much money, I suppose. Now, if you're new here, welcome. If you're not, welcome back. You've just watched Jetavision's review on Endoparasitic 2. If you like this video and want to keep up to date with our latest, subscribe to the channel, follow the Twitter, and join the Discord. Mac Cheese to Jetavision, signing out. You all have a good one. Peace.